Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and this right here is the dwarf planet known as Ceres located in the asteroid belt. And somewhere in the orbit of this dwarf planet there's a beautiful NASA probe known as Dawn that's been there for a few years now. This probe is known for setting a new record in ion engine propulsion by allowing it to change its velocity by about 11.5 km per second or 26,000 miles a few years ago when it was changing its orbit from Vesta to Ceres. But in the last few years there were also a lot more advances in the ion engine technologies and I wanted to talk about them in this video. So let's discuss this in more detail and welcome to What The Math. So generally when we think of rocket engines this is what we kind of imagine. But many of you know that there are also ion engines that have been in use for a long time now and they're also quite powerful but in a different sense. While a typical rocket engine has a lot of power to lift an object and to take it into space, the advantage of an ion engine is that it can actually use a lot less fuel to achieve the same type of velocity that a typical rocket engine could achieve. But because their overall power is much lower than a typical rocket engine, we can't just use ion engines to lift objects. For now, the ion engines have really only been used in space and in conditions where there's no air friction and no gravity to worry about. And although a typical ion engine cannot really lift anything from planet Earth, they're still extremely efficient. Normally, this type of an engine, using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, would produce roughly around 10 megajoules per kilogram of fuel. Whereas the ion engine inside the Dawn probe was able to produce approximately 43 times more energy out of the same amount of fuel. But the fuel here is of course different. These engines use xenon. And the way that these engines usually work is explained in this animation made by NASA. It all starts when the xenon atoms become ionized or become positive and are then shut out of the engine itself through extremely powerful magnetic forces that are right here in this chamber. And as they leave the engines at roughly around 10% of the speed of light, they manage to accelerate the craft to extreme velocities. And the first major achievement for ion engines um, for the interplanetary probes was the Deep Space One probe that was launched in 1998 to try to take pictures of a comet that was able to change its velocity by roughly around 4.5 kilometers per second. In this animation made by NASA you can kind of see the probe itself changing its orbit and also the date available right here. So it took it quite a long time and actually years here to change the velocity by only about four and a half kilometers per second. So the way that ion engines usually work, unlike these types of engines, is by firing for a very, very long time, months and even years. And by doing this, they're able to achieve extreme efficiency when it comes to fuel use. But today, a lot of satellites orbiting planet Earth also use ion engines for different types of corrections or to maintain their orbit, so it has become a very useful technology for a lot of different types of space missions. As a matter of fact, SpaceX's Starlink, which will have over 1500 different satellites in orbit, all use this type of technology to maintain their orbit. But interestingly, or I guess in some sense ironically, most satellites, including these ones, use the Soviet version of the ion engine, originally developed back in 1971. It's actually slightly different, and in some sense more efficient than the so-called grid ion engine that you see right here, that's often used in American missions, and relies on something called the Hall effect, so sometimes these engines are referred to as the Hall ion engines with some of the newer versions of these engines being able to achieve up to about 100,000 kilowatts of power, but unfortunately still really not being enough to, for example, lift a rocket from the ground or be used in far regions of space. And the reason for this is because they actually require a tremendous amount of energy to function. So as you move away from the sun and essentially reach farther and farther regions of the solar system, there's really almost no way for us to start generating energy. The current calculations suggest that if you were to, for example, take a nuclear power plant with you to try to power these engines, for efficient propulsion system to actually be able to function in the far regions of space, you would need roughly around 17 tons of different material that's going to be powering the nuclear plant. And that's of course not including all of the other stuff you need to bring for the ion engines to function. So it does become a little bit less efficient the farther you go. 
Which is also why ion engines have only been predominantly used in the inner parts of the solar system and why we haven't really advanced the technology that far just yet. But now we may have reached the next step in this technology, the step that might allow us to create these engines and use these engines here on planet Earth in the atmosphere. Because not so long ago the MIT scientists and MIT students were able to create an ion engine propulsion using airplane technology. Which in some sense is equivalent to the 1902 flight by the Wright brothers when they were able to achieve flight using, well, airplanes. Within only 50 years after this, the airplanes became the predominant force in the world and the major method of transportation. And so the first ion engine flight that was achieved back in 2018 is sort of equivalent to the original Wright brothers flight. So this engine works on a slightly different principle, and instead of using a propellant or any kind of fuel, it tries to create ions and also release ions directly from the air. As explained in the Nature paper that you can find in the description below, this airplane itself contains no movable parts, but inside its wings it contains two very important parts, specifically right here and right here, that are responsible for ionizing and propelling the craft. In a nutshell, it kind of works like this if you were to look at it from the side. This part right here produces about 20,000 volts of electricity, which is responsible for ionizing nitrogen in the air as the aircraft is flying and turning it into nitrogen ions that are then propelled into the negatively charged wing of the aircraft. As this happens, there is obviously the current that then creates the airflow, which then lifts the craft. It does seem like a very simple idea, but the thing is, it seems to work, and it seems to work really, really well. So well, as a matter of fact, that several trials were conducted using exactly the same setup, and the airplane flew just fine. And although this is not exactly the same as an ion engine that we use in space, it does use a somewhat similar principle of using ions for a propellant. Now, this was the first flight, we haven't really had any advances since, but using this technology and using a very similar principle, the scientists from the European Space Agency realized that they can actually use something similar in satellites. And what they realized is that if you were to place a satellite in high enough orbit where it doesn't really receive enough drag from the air, but it also gets a little bit of atoms here and there, we can then take all of these atoms turn them ionic and use them as a kind of a propellant very similar to how the MIT scientists use it for their airplane, which would allow satellites in low Earth orbit to continuously propel themselves, preventing the degradation of orbit and possibly using this technology for some other means as well. It has also been suggested that, due to how thin the Martian atmosphere is, we might be able to use these types of engines and this type of propulsion to actually fly around Mars as well which would be absolutely brilliant if we can achieve it. And what's more is that they already have a prototype built and ready to go. In other words, we might be able to have this technology going and working within only the next few years or so. And all of this started with this first flight at MIT. So in the next few years, and I guess in the next decade or so, we might have a lot of new incredible technology coming out based on the idea of ion engine propulsion and it actually might redefine how we travel the Earth and also possibly the rest of the solar system. But it doesn't really mean that these engines are going away. We still need them to get to space. These are the most efficient engines we currently have. Although hypothetically, with time we might be able to build an ion engine that can use these principles to actually lift us higher and higher into the atmosphere and eventually reach space as well. So these incredible new advances in ion engine propulsion will help us reach the next level of space exploration and even the air travel might change with time. New airplanes might be using this technology as well. And so hopefully in the next few years we'll hear more about the European Space Agency new engine and hopefully we'll get its first flight as well. But until then, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. And you can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.